just start it off real quick. So hello, my name is, um, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for um, this webinar. Uh, my name is Monica Chapman and I um, am the project coordinator for the Kareska King Book Awards and the um, Old Los Roundtables and the Office for Diversity, Literacy and Outreach Services. Um, our office mission is to support the library and information science workers in creating all exclusive spaces that serve and represent the entire community. To accomplish this, we decant power and privilege by facilitating conversations around the access and identity as they impact the profession and those we serve. We use social justice framework and strive to create an association culture where these concerns are incorporated into everyone's everyday work. Um, I just want to start today off with a few housekeeping notes. Um, please use the Q&A feature for um, content questions for the presenters. Um, we'll track the questions and the presenters will address them at the end of the presentation. And then, um, sorry, my page got stuck as I was reading this. <laughs> um, and, uh, We'll be use, we will not be using the raise hand feature at this time. And otherwise, please enjoy today's session. All right, so it's over to me. All right, so hello everyone. Welcome to Democracy in the Time of COVID-19. I'm Julianne Winkelstein. Uh, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm currently stably housed. I'm a member of the Social Responsibilities Roundtable and the coordinator for the Hunger, Homelessness and Poverty Task Force, co-coordinator, and as, as well as the co-coordinator for the CERT or Social Responsibilities Roundtable newsletter. I'm really excited about today's panel and I hope that everyone who comes to this, has, has attended this, will come away inspired to take action that addresses the barriers being experienced by people who won't want to vote. A fair and accessible election process locally, regionally and nationally is critical for the health of our communities and our country. And now onto our moderator, Dr. Price. Welcome everybody. Welcome to the American Library Association Social Responsibility Roundtable panel on the topic that I'm sure all of us are thinking about, which is democracy in the time of COVID. My name is Melanie Price. I'm an endowed professor of political science at Prairie View a and University. And as all of this COVID thing has been happening, my most recent job has become um, a chair of the Ruth J. Simmons Center for the Study of Race and Justice. So it's a big job with a big name on top. And so we will see how it, how it goes. And since this is the Library Association, I'm happy to also say that I contribute to your work because I write books. My most recent book you'll see on the screen is The Race Whisperer, Barack Obama and the Political Uses of Race. This afternoon, I'm happy to moderate a robust panel, um, panel discussion and also give audience members a chance to ask questions of these esteemed panelists. This session will also include two clips from the award-winning documentary, Rigged, The Voter Suppression Playbook. So first, let me introduce our panelists. Carol Anderson, lay your hands, in case they were wondering which one is, oh, that's right, you can see it on the word. Don't worry about it. Carol Anderson is the Charles Howard Candler Professor of African American Studies at Emory University and author of White Rage, The Unspoken Truth of Our Nation's Divide, a New York Times bestseller, Washington Post Notable Book of 2016, and a National Book Critics Circle Award winner. Most recently, she authored One Person, No Vote, How Voter Suppression is Destroying Our Democracy. David Daly is the author of the recently released Unrigged, How Americans Are Battling Back to Save Democracy. His earlier book, and this is a thing I never thought I would be saying anywhere, anytime, rat fucked. <laughs> Why Your Vote Doesn't Count <laughs> reveals how the insidious use of gerrymandering is dismantling our democracy. His journalism work has appeared in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Slate, Washington Post, and New York Magazine. He is a senior fellow at Fair Vote and the former editor of Salon. Mac Heller is the executive producer of Rigged, the voter suppression playbook. Max spent much of his career as a managing partner at Goldman Sachs and then went on to start an electric car company, Coda. He and his company, he and the company he launched in 2016, um, 
In 2016, the American Issues Initiative are deeply committed to the core belief that voters should choose their politicians, not politicians choose their voters. I love that. I love that statement, which led him to make red. Lastly, we have Tomas Lopez, who is uh, Democracy North Carolina's executive director. Previously, he was counsel with the Democracy Program at the Brenton Cent Brennan Center for Justice and NYU School of Law. As a voting rights attorney there, he litigated against restrictive voting laws in federal court and partnered with advocates to advance and defend election reforms at the state level. Now here's Mac Heller, Riggs executive producer. He's gonna briefly introduce the first clip we will see. Thanks, Professor Price, and thanks everybody for attending. Thanks to the ALA and Julie for getting us all together. Uh, we're gonna show a 14-minute uh, clip from Rig, and it is, uh, you can call it a short documentary. It is cinema verite, meaning it's just footage um, uh, from actual events in 2016. It captures a frightening uh, course of events resulting in the removal from the voting rolls of about 6,000 people in Cumberland County, North Carolina in 2016. Um, and I will let the film uh, speak for itself. Here we go. If you care about vote fraud, gentlemen, we're fighting it. We could use your help. Thanks. Hey, if you care about vote fraud, we're fighting it. We could use your help. Thank you. If you care about vote fraud, gentlemen, we're fighting it. We could use your help. Thanks. Thank you. I know a girl who votes eight times and has a million dollars in the bank and uh, is on food stamps to get everything for free, even college. How do you know she votes eight times? Because we know her. She does. Would you call me later? the Voter Integrity Project. I was a military officer, a retired lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. I became worried that this is a fragile system that depends on people, people being fair and honest. If you're worried about vote fraud, here's how we're fighting it tomorrow. We could use your help. They're hiding something, and we're on to them. And that's uh, the only question. It's not how many, it's, you know, we know they're doing it. The question is, how big a deal is it? Are they really trying to steal an entire nation? And a lot of people are going through life with blinders on, or like I used to tell people, it's called the toilet paper tube syndrome. You got toilet paper tubes in front of your eyes, and all you see is that lid. I'm sorry, I think they muted everyone and that somehow muted the sound. So if our tech people can um, unmute the screen that's showing that, it would be very useful. <sighs> Darnell, it's Mac. Can we um, find the sound? We'll need to backtrack by about a minute. Thank you guys so much for your patience. We know in the Zoom, in the Zoom world, um, all kinds of things like this happen. And so thank you for your patience. Someone else would like to know if it's possible to add closed captioning. Do you have that capability, Mac? Do you know? No, but I bet you what I could do is give you the voiceover. So that's Mike Hires on the left and that's Jerry Reinel on the right. And they are two uh, guys in the North Carolina Voter Integrity Project. I think Darnell's going to head back and see if we can get it right. 
I always wished you went and found that woman that those people claim they knew with the million dollars and <laughs> who votes eight times. I was like, why didn't he ask her? Can I meet your magical friend? Yeah, and the, and the key line, we know a girl, you know, what's that mean? <laughs> we know her. You know someone in a million dollar house on food stamps. It's a miracle. Like, I just wish you had found them. Now Carol's muted. You're muted, Carol. Now you're muted. They muted all of us. Many Not you and me, said. Melanie. Yes. <laughs> we refuse to be silenced. If you care about vote fraud, oh, gentlemen, we're fighting it. We could use your help. Thanks. Hey, if you care about vote fraud, we're fighting it. We could use your help. Thank you. If you care about vote fraud, gentlemen, we're fighting it. We could use your help. Thanks. Thank you. I know a girl who votes eight times and has a million dollars in the bank and uh, really is on food stamps and gets everything for free, even college. How do you know she votes eight times? <laughs> because we know her. She does. Would you call me later? the Voter Integrity Project. I was a military officer, a retired lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. I became worried that this is a fragile system that depends on people, people being fair and honest. If you're worried about vote fraud, here's how we're fighting it tomorrow. We could use your help. They're hiding something, and we're on to them. And that's uh, the only question. It's not how many, it's, you know, we know they're doing it. The question is, how big a deal is it? Are they really trying to steal an entire nation? And a lot of people are going through life with blinders on, or like I used to tell people, it's called the toilet paper tube syndrome. You got toilet paper tubes in front of your eyes, and all you see is that little bit of world right out in front of you through the toilet paper tubes. You don't see what all's going on out here. So if, if you're looking right here and you're not looking for voter fraud, you won't see voter fraud. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Evan Hires. I'm a 100% disabled veteran. I'm not married. I have the time, I have the skills, and have the desire to make sure that every American vote is legally cast. The Voting Integrity Project is interesting. They've always had a bit of a gadfly, renegade, vigilante voter fraud, you know, crusaders. They claimed that thousands of non-citizens were voting in the state where they would challenge voters at county boards of elections, and then they couldn't prove that really any of those were true. It's about time we turn the lights on in the kitchen and started cleaning the cockroaches out of here. Is there anyone in the audience today who received a notice that if they wished their name not to be removed from the voter rolls, they should be present? Stand up then and give us your name, please. Man. Randy Burkett. Jamie. Okay, sir. John McKee. Well, North Carolina has a provision where a citizen can challenge the right of another citizen to vote. It's been on the books forever. Who else is going to know who's registered to vote unless another citizen does it? Some of the laws that wind up being discriminatory today had discriminatory intent when they were first written in the early 1900s as part of the Jim Crow laws. For example, voter purging laws to cleanse the rolls. And this was typically used in the Jim Crow area by whites who were trying to prevent newly enfranchised African Americans from having access to the ballot box. Michael's methodology involves finding voters that the state identified as inactive. These people have missed two federal elections. So they were listed as inactive. And I started sending letters to these inactive voters on the Cumberland County voter rolls. The ones that came back marked by the post office as undeliverable are considered evidence that the voter no longer resides at that address. And Mike challenged those voters. What the letter essentially says to Purim to maintain my voter registration uh, as it is currently today. Whoever this guy is has challenged my right to vote. But the only way to defend your registration was to go in person. The process heavily favors the person doing the challenging. Not everybody is going to get a letter or have the time to defend it. What do you want this board to know concerning your place of residence? My primary place of residence is the address on my voter registration. 
Yeah, I'll make a motion that the challenge to Ms. Burkett be dismissed. Second. Yeah. On favor say aye. 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 The challenge against you is dismissed. Your voter registration remains. Now let's move on to Mr. John Lamont McKeithen Jr. Some people have the knack of spotting anomalies. It's kind of like seeing a lump of coal in a bale of cotton. It, it'll just pop right out at you. So let me just ask you, what do you want this board to know concerning your place of residence? Uh, I do live and have lived at 7790 Stony Point Road. It's at 7790. Mm -hmm. yeah, this is 7770. Is there a possibility that people got struck from the rolls mistakenly because the post office did not appropriately deliver the mail? Still, there is a small, small possibility on that. Challenges shall not be made indiscriminately. It was instilled in us to vote. My grandma raised me up and my sister up to vote. You know, when we turned 18, that was all right. Address. Um, the address when I registered was 7660 Bridge Street Service. I'm going to have to have you stand in that line so they can update you. Okay. All right. Next voter, please. I need to be I got an old one. Here, is this your address? No, ma'am. She told me I could not vote at all. Because I got to re-register because I'm, I'm nowhere in the system. They're not making it easy at all. It's, it's tiresome. Yeah. When I found out um, that I was purged off the roads, and I was highly upset about it. Because, I, like I said, I mean, I grew up seeing my family vote. I know it's my God-given right today to vote, and I want to vote. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give concerning this matter shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall help you God? I do. All the evidence shows that when someone is purged from the rolls, it's extremely unlikely that they're going to re-register. It's hard to get them to re-register. And I worry that it will diminish the will to participate in the political process. And the danger is, if states use unreliable information to take voters off the rolls, and if they do not give voters adequate notice and an opportunity to contest their removal, then we can have a situation where hundreds or even thousands of legitimate voters are being taken off of the rolls without their knowledge. Good morning. Persons were engaging in an attempt to get voters purged, especially African Americans. We are fighting this. We believe and we hope that the courts will agree with us and we will have an immediate temporary restraining order. Reverend Barber, uh, that guy's made a name for himself. <laughs> I <laughs> uh, congratulate him on a, on a well-funded, uh, he has a lot of, a lot of out-of-state funding money and um, he knows how to play that race card better than anybody I've seen and really since the heyday of Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton, he has played that race card so well. The NAACP filed a voter suppression lawsuit against the North Carolina Board of Elections and today they won that case with a federal judge declaring that all voters purged from the voting rolls must be reinstated. The NAACP in North Carolina, they filed a lawsuit in federal court uh, and actually they went judge shopping. They found, a, uh, they found a black female judge that they could influence uh, emotionally, in my, in my opinion, and not so humble opinion at that. Those of us who are the descendants of people who had their cars blown up out of side of churches right here in North Carolina when they were inside the church organizing for voting rights. When you come from that kind of lineage, you're not going to allow some loudmouth bigot to intimidate you. The courts have said, you know, you can't do any of this kind of stuff in the last 90 days. But they're going to put all these names back on the roll. We had a guy who worked for two years and got over 6,000 names removed in Cumberland County. And they claimed that we were targeting blacks. I would be glad to get drug into federal court because that will give me the opportunity to expose the problems that we have in this state. I get three hots and a cot and full medical care if I go to jail. 
except how are you going to put me in jail for following the law? It's a Tuesday morning, but not just any Tuesday morning, Election Day. Good morning, America. Election Day 2016. Election Day officially starts right now. So who did you vote for? Tough decision. If Hillary wins, I'm done, probably. I, I don't know what will happen, but it scares the crap out of me, because if, if she wins, I'm afraid I'll be hunted down like a dog. <laughs> Michael Evan Hires. There you go. Thank you very much. Morning. My name's Michael Hires. Michael Hires. It's a pleasure to meet you. The, uh, well, you may not think so but when you re go back and research my name, but. I've been the I'm the fellow that's been following the voter challenges. Mm -hmm. Let's face it, there are unscrupulous people out there, and they could go to the polls and impersonate mm -hmm. and impersonate somebody. I tell you what, it was I, a pleasure. if I could get more people of all I don't hate to say race because we're all human race, yes. but more ethnic backgrounds involved in this, mm -hmm. that way people wouldn't be taking pot shots at me. The NAACP is hot as a pistol at me right now, claiming I'm suppressing the black vote. Well, I think you would... They're accusing me of targeting minorities. Okay. okay. They're trying to throw mud on the wall and trying to get it to stick. Really but if you're interested in getting involved, uh, look up voterintegrityproject.com. I will remember that. Right now I have to uh, go on late for work. Okay. Well, have a good day. What we're going to try and do is have data collectors sitting there passively collecting data on license plate numbers, see if we can figure out which people, if any, are going from voting location to voting location. The illegitimate reason would be if someone is what we call a serial voter and going from location A to B to C using a different name at each one. And what we want to know is how prevalent is this? Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. Emergency, emergency, call me. Uh, uh, can I talk about one state that's going to come up at 7 o'clock that we so have? So what we could do is call the State Board of Elections and have them intervene. Yeah. But I just called somebody with an undercover camera. The bottom line is we're trying to collect evidence okay. of voter impersonation fraud. This is what I call criminal enterprise level vote fraud. You seen any vote fraud? <laughs> Not yet. I gotta take this. Hey, Jim. Have you uh, seen any fraud, heard of any fraud? Uh, no, we, we have not. No, with only with only six data collectors, the odds of getting someone who showed up at two locations are slim and none. Basically, if, it, if you had, if you want to challenge me, you know, please contact me first. A challenge is a challenge, and if I challenge you to a chess match, I need you to play with me. You know, at least come back, you know, show me what you got. So, yeah. and until we can say, without doubt, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all, until that means exactly what it says, we are still working toward becoming a more perfect union. Okay, we're back. I've actually seen that more than once, and every time I see it, I don't know, every time I see it, I just want to scream, uh, how, how do you fit this into your mind? But anyway, our topic today is democracy in the time of COVID-19. We're trying to understand the, how Americans will come to grip with this election process in the middle of a public health crisis. 
And if questions come to mind, I ask those who are watching to please use the Q&A panel and we will get to them after a few questions from me. I'm also going to ask our panel, our panelists to, I know we have a lot to talk about and we're very impassioned, to try to keep it to as short of an answer as possible. Um, and if you see me start to do this, because there's no way, if we were sitting at a table together, I could just sort of hunt you, but I can't do that here. So I'll let you know. We're going to start with you first, Carol. Um, we know that at emancipation, Black men were active voters and Black people of, Black people completely were active political advocates for themselves. Can you discuss a little bit how voter suppression has evolved since the 15th Amendment and whether or not this latest sort of form of voter suppression is more overt, less overt, and how it impacts our democracy? Okay. That's and, a lot. Okay, in three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Two. <laughs> Two. Okay. Um, one of the key things to me is to understand that in Mississippi in 1890, the legislature created the Mississippi plan coming out of the Mississippi's new Jim Crow constitution. What it was designed to do was to stop black people from voting without writing a law saying we don't want black people to vote because the 15th amendment that says the state shall not abridge the right to vote on account of race, color or previous condition of servitude. So what Mississippi did was to say, we'll use the societally imposed conditions on black people and make those conditions the access to the ballot box. So like poverty, when you've had centuries of unpaid labor, then black coat, then sharecropping, requiring somebody to pay a small fee and making it seem reasonable if you believed in democracy and democracy is expensive, you'd pay a small fee. Well, that small fee, the poll tax, amounted to somewhere between two to 6% of a Mississippi farm family's annual income. And it was cumulative. So if you couldn't pay it the first year and it took you 20 years to pay it, you owe 20 years of back taxes. The US Supreme Court said that the poll tax did not violate the 15th Amendment because everybody had to pay it. You saw that with the other things like the literacy test. When you fast forward to where we are after Shelby County v. Holder, you are seeing these states like North Carolina, and I know Tomas will talk about this, um, using the societally imposed conditions, like having to go to work so you cut early voting days, like not having different types of IDs so you make the IDs, the types of IDs that Black people don't have, the, the holy grail in order to be able to, to vote. So it's the same pattern with the same underlying tectonic plates and using those societally imposed conditions to block access to the ballot box and frankly, Obama's 2008 election really got this thing going as the film Rich demonstrates. Thank you. Um, it's interesting that you start with Mississippi today as they take the, as they're in the process of taking the stars and bars off of their state flag. And so um, I know that state, the black people in that state are jubilant today uh, thinking about this, but also trying to figure out how to undo some of those laws that you talked about that are still on the books. Mm -hmm. um, David. Your first book, Rat Fucked, I can't stop saying it, I just don't know why, uh, focused on Project Red Map, which helped Republicans take over a number of key legislatures in 2019, including North Carolina's. Um, can you explain to us what Red Map was and how we might be still living in a Red Map world today? Absolutely, um, and it's a pleasure to be on such an amazing panel. Uh, these everybody, everybody here are heroes, um, so thank you for having me. Um, let me pick up right where Carol left off. Um, I mean, Barack Obama is elected president in 2008, and it's a big night for the Democratic Party. Uh, Democrats win a supermajority in the US Senate that night. They take um, the US House once again, um, and they have a terrific night in state legislatures and governorships nationwide. Um, if you go back and look at the TV coverage that night, folks were talking about how uh, the Republican Party was going to be a minority party in this country for a generation to come. And it didn't exactly work out that way, did it? Um, this is because sophisticated Republican strategists 
understood that while the 2008 election might have been historic, the 2010 election had the ability to be much more consequential. Uh, 2010 was a census year, which means it's a redistricting year. In 2011, all of the state legislative maps around the country would be redrawn. Um, and what Republicans did was they launched a strategy called Red Map, the redistricting majority project. And they invested $30 million, which is really a pittance um, in, in by political standards. Um, but they didn't do this at the, at the White House level or the US Senate level. They invested in these down ballot local state legislative races, races that had never seen this kind of money or national political sophistication dropped into them. Um, Republicans focused on 117 state legislative races across 16 states and they're Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Florida, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, all of the states we, that keep coming up, right, time and again when we talk about voter suppression or when we talk about the states that narrowly went for uh, Donald Trump in 2016 and tipped the Electoral College in his direction despite um, a, a, a difference in the popular vote of 2.8 million. Um, and Red Map essentially becomes the firewall for the Republican Party in all of these states. So in 2011, the, the map makers go and they work their magic, uh, their uh, fancy algorithms and statistical uh, uh, big data, and they come up with these maps that in all of these states uh, give Republicans huge advantages time and again in all of these elections. Uh, Democrats have not taken back a political chamber in any of those key states all decade, even when they win more votes. So Wisconsin. Do you think we should be concerned about um, a red map for 2020, which is also a census year? So should we be concerned about what 2021's redistricting will look like? Oh, we should be terrified. Um, I mean, right now there's 59 million Americans who live in a state in which one or both chambers of the state legislature is compared is controlled by the party that won fewer votes in 2018. 2021 is the next chance that the Democrats get at the maps. Um, and we can talk about some of the specific state by state, but it's it's an uphill road if you look at this state by state. The maps that were drawn in 2011, those lines have held all decade long. Yeah. Um, the Voter Integrity Project, Mac. So go ahead and unmute yourself because I'm coming to you now. Yeah, the Voter Integrity Project. If it wasn't so serious what they were doing, it'd almost be laughable, right? And I think sometimes when I've shown this to my students, they laugh because it's these two old guys wandering around looking for nothing, but they don't understand the ways in which this is actually so insidious. They don't see themselves as racist, though. Can you talk to us a little bit about their thought process, and can you tell us whether or not we'll be, we should be worried about them in the coming election? Melanie, when you talk, sit down and talk with Mike and Jay, um, they would describe themselves as patriots, and they believe that they are restoring the integrity to our elections. Uh, they're sure they're not motivated by racism, and there are many people like them. Uh, and we need to remember that they are sure that they're operating in good faith. It's easy to look from the outside and challenge that, but that's their core belief. And many are like them. And now we live in a world where uh, the, the current president has uh, legitimized that. He is, th there are tens of millions of people who feel that they've been deputized by him uh, to uh, fight voter fraud. And um, it's a significant movement, perhaps more significant in 2020 than uh, in 2016. Just for context, you've seen the full film and you know that we show uh, this guy, Greg Phillips, who was a source of the 3 million fraudulent votes in the 2016 election, which Trump picked up. And Greg promised to come up with the evidence and name the names and all that. And then a few months later, wouldn't you know, he deleted the tweet. The president keeps going, but 
but the source of the allegation has deleted it. Well, Greg has an association with a national uh, voter integrity group called True the Vote, and True the Vote uh, sent out an email uh, last week, including the following language. So you ask, is this going to be a thing in 2020? Here we go. Radicalized leftist organizations are hard at work in every state to exploit the weaknesses of our electoral process, actively promoting the registration and mobilization of unqualified voters, harvesting mail-in ballots that have been fraudulently collected, lobbying for same-day voter registration, no voter ID requirements, non-citizen voting, and engaging in outright data manipulation. Um, so they're now in the let's raise some money stage, but uh, the shame is gone, the shackles are off. The, um, I'll, I'll give you one other nugget, which is the, my wife is from Clark County, Mississippi, and the next county over is Jones County, which some of you may remember as the site of a movie called Free State of Jones. There was a um, uh, uh, little bit of a revolt uh, during the Civil War, but the uh, election commissioner of Jones County, Mississippi, Gail Harrison Welch, uh, uh, sent out an email saying, among other things, the following, the blacks are having lots of events for voter registration. People in Mississippi have to get involved too. Uh, so it's just a different perspective and uh, it's quite widespread and the shame is gone. Well, Tomas, you have your, your, your this is your everyday kind of thing that you're battling. Um, and so we've already seen uh, primaries in Georgia and in Wisconsin during this age of COVID. We've seen the babies sitting outside, moms with their babies in the rain for four and five hours. What are you expecting to happen in the fall in North Carolina? And what would you like to see? Yeah, thank you for, for raising that. And I wanna, I wanna share that. And I wanna share that with some, some points on the front end, right? The first is um, that I think a through line through everything that we're saying, right, is that you cannot tell the story of voting in this country without telling the story of race. And, you know, the inverse is also true. That, that's the first thing, right? The, the second thing is that uh, we are um, facing, even separately from that, a hugely complicating uh, set of circumstances in light of the, the coronavirus and the public health crisis that, that it poses. And then the third is that you've got the, um, you've got a sustained effort over the past decade plus to both diminish access to voting or diminish the effectiveness of voting. And what we're facing this year is those things coming together. Um, and the ways in which the public health crisis uh, ends up being a multiplier is because of the ways in which COVID-19 disproportionately affects black and brown communities. So here in North Carolina, I think about places like uh, Siler City, which is you know, about an hour and change from Durham where I live, where um, there's a big Latinx community, people working in poultry plants where they are higher than uh, you know, far higher than average COVID-19 rates. Um, these are things that affect people's ability to go vote in person. Um, that is why things like absentee ballot access matter. Um, so I wanna, I, I will lay out um, a few things, a few pressures we're seeing in light of COVID and what I hope it will happen. And the first pressure, first, <laughs> not resources, but just money for election. Yes. Two, there's a big hit on voter registration. Right, voter registration has just fallen off a cliff this much. Third, there's a far increased demand for mail ballots, and there are and the mail balloting culture is very different in different states. One thing you will hear here, we're talking about this year's election. They're having 50 different elections in 50 different states with different rules everywhere. So that that story about mail ballots is going to be different in every single state. In North Carolina, it's not very popular. So that's another thing that poses barriers. And the fourth, like you referenced, Georgia, Wisconsin, pressures on in-person voting. The fact that so many of our poll workers are older folks, more vulnerable to COVID is one of the key reasons why 
we're seeing scenes of people waiting in long lines, polling places closing at the last minute. So what do we need in response? We need a collective response, especially from the people who run our elections and who fund our elections to make sure that people have reasonable access to every channel possible to voting. And we also need people who are civically engaged, who are the kinds of people who might normally knock on doors during an election for, you know, for their cause or for their candidate. We need people to become poll workers this year because that's gonna be one of the key ways we keep polling places open to ensure that we've got voting access. Thank you. Um, I think it's funny the way Max said that uh, the guys from the Voter Integrity Project would call themselves patriots. But I think, Carol, you can talk to us a little bit about the ways in which sometimes things that seem race neutral actually aren't. And so the current voter suppression efforts, are they strictly partisan? Or are they really a way to focus on suppressing the vote of non-white people? Or can you actually separate those things? I'm going to go with two quotes and then go from there, but I'm going to do this quickly. The first quote is from Paul Weyrich, who was the co-founder of the Heritage Foundation and the head of ALEC, that was the group that helped metastasize these voter suppression laws out. In 19 and stand your ground too. Alec is also stand your ground as well. Yeah, it's just yeah. Um, and so in 1980, Paul Weyrich said, "You know, all of you are goo goos. You believe in good government. Well, I don't because you want everybody to vote, but I don't because frankly, our leverage goes up as the voting populace goes down. Now that is the framework right there." our leverage goes up, our power goes up, the more that we can constrict this voting population. First one. The second one is Lee Atwater. Lee Atwater was Ronald Reagan's chief strategist for the Southern strategy, which was to woo in disaffected whites from the Democratic Party into the Republican Party. And he said, in 1954, you could use the, the N word, didn't hurt you. He said, Woo, but by 1968, it hurts you. It backfires. And so you start talking about all of these economic things and you start getting really abstract. You start talking about busing and taxes. But the whole point is that blacks get hurt worse than whites. And so there you have the groundwork because whites are going to get hit but they help provide the fig leaf of cover that this isn't racially motivated. I mean, how could this be racially motivated? I mean, because, you know, my white neighbor got purged. But when you look at voter roll purges, for instance, they had inactive voters. What we know is that those who are inactive are overwhelmingly young people, poor people, and minorities. And inactive in that they don't vote in every federal election. So if you go after that group, you're gonna get some whites. But the target is, how do we stop black folk from voting? It's the Obama coalition. How do we stop black folk from voting? How do we stop Hispanics from voting? How do we stop Asian Americans from voting? How do we stop young people from voting? And how do we stop poor people from voting? By knocking off members in each of those groups via a series, just like the Mississippi plan, if the poll tax doesn't get them, the literacy test will. If the literacy test doesn't get them, the, the grandfather clause will. Grandfather clause, understanding clause. If not understanding clause, good character clause. If voter ID doesn't get them, voter roll purges will. Voter roll purges doesn't get them, then poll closures will. Poll closures won't get them, then shutting down early voting will. If shutting early voting will, I mean, it's just, it's the same pattern, the same target. And COVID-19, as Tomas noted, plays just on the Mississippi plan as well. We'll use the societally imposed conditions. We know that it's the societally imposed conditions that make African-Americans and Latinos overly vulnerable to the coronavirus. And so by being race neutral, just the way the poll tax and the literacy tests were, um, it allows these laws to, to continue on only unlike, unless you get somebody like in North Carolina where they openly pull racialized data 
to then craft the law. If you don't have that, that clear level of intent, it is really hard. But they laugh and they are giddy, as they said in Wisconsin, about stopping the folk in Milwaukee from voting. You know, Dave, uh, David, I think one of the things that gives me hope in all of this, right? I mean, there are these moments, and you talk about them in Unrigged, where these sort of citizen-led ballot initiatives actually turn some things around. And so when I'm in despair, like I listen to Carol, and I, I lecture in my own Black politics classes that same list, and then right as the students start crying, I say, but what about Amendment 4 <laughs> in Florida that expanded the, uh, the, the number of people who are enfranchised since we started letting 18 year old votes in 1971. So here's your chance to give us something to hold on to. Tell us a little bit about Amendment 4 and why it's so important. I wrote on Rigged because I had been going around the country feeling as if there was that, you know, dark cloud over. Oh no. All right, he seems to hear. Okay, good. To, uh, and in 2018, there were these amazing victories on behalf of voting rights and democracy around the country and in places where you might not expect them. Amendment 4 in Florida is a fantastic example of this, returning voting rights to 1.4 million people who had been convicted of a felony in Florida, um, who had been caught up in, in, in laws that go all the way back to the Jim Crow era. Um, it was in many ways the largest expansion of the vote since the Voting Rights Act, and it didn't pass narrowly in Florida. It passed with 64% of the vote in a year in which Ron DeSantis squeaks into the governorship and in which Rick Scott squeaks into the Senate. So if 50% if, if, if plus one are, are voting uh, for uh, the candidates, 64% got behind a, a major voting rights expansion about, about fairness and about upending these old vestiges of the Jim Crow South. You had five states in 2018 that um, enacted some form of redistricting uh, reform um, and, um, and took a bit of a shot at partisan gerrymandering. Um, all of them a little bit different. Missouri, Utah, Colorado, Ohio, and Michigan. Um, with the exception of Utah, where it was very close, all of the other states, 60, 70 percent of the people. Um, so voters, I think, very much see these issues as issues of, of fairness, as issues of a democracy. Uh, it is a handful of people inside political parties that are willing to use these as a cudgel to divide us. But when these issues get put to the ballot, Americans stand up and defend the right to vote of themselves and of other people. Uh, I want to leave it on, on a high note and not talk about how the uh, gerrymandered legislatures in all of these states have gone after these laws. And yeah, of course. We know that's the case, but it just seems a little so I will hold <laughs> on, But um, all of these, you know, citizens did this. The political parties didn't do it. Citizens stood up to these huge structural barriers that politicians, the media, the experts said were too high, too big, too stout to ever come down, and they pushed and pushed and they fell. So, Mac, I have a t-shirt from you guys that says voter suppression playbook with the things, all the things that people are doing to suppress the vote. So I thought, first of all, there should probably be something on the back of that shirt to say the voter anti-suppression play, but give us like three things that we can all be doing, paying attention to, to try to fight against voter suppression. Look, as David has said and Carol has said, uh, these things all take place at the state level. And so when there are uh, state laws that come up this way or state legislative elections uh, uh, as to which voter uh, uh, rules are relevant, fight hard. And when there's a citizen initiative, fight very, very hard, number one. Number two, call it out. Uh, you know, 
I'm, I'm not talking about looking ahead to voter suppression in 2020. It's been going on. They've already purged people from the voting rolls. They've already showed their hand in terms of, oh, I'm so sorry, downtown Milwaukee, we just didn't have enough poll workers. We didn't have enough machines. We feel horrible. How did this happen? I'm shocked. And so the, the, the old playbook uh, is alive and well. Uh, closed polling places in the poor part of town. Fewer machines, fewer poll workers, longer lines, shorter hours, no early voting, no Sunday voting, um, uh, no after hours voting, typical stuff. But the layer on top of it that I would encourage citizens to be active about is voting by mail. Obviously, it's going to be crucial. It won't shock anyone to hear that one party is in favor of uh, uh, wide access to voting and the other is not. And there's litigation going on in uh, 14 or 15 states at this point. What's the litigation over? Is it okay for the Secretary of State to send an absentee ballot application to every voter? Well, it should be, but um, uh, one party is fighting that in many states. How um, does the voter authenticate that it is he or she who filled out the ballot? Well, in Oklahoma, you need two witnesses. In Minnesota, they wanted to make a notarization requirement. And Carol, if this rhymes with some stuff from 1903, um, uh, so burdensome signature match and signature authentication requirements. Do absentee ballots, vote by mail ballots, really the same thing, need to be postmarked before election day or delivered before election day? If it's delivered before election day, then the voter's responsible for the quality of mail service in the poor part of town. Guess where mail service is slower. And finally, uh, do you have to, is it postage prepaid or do you have to put on a stamp? And I heard a story, not confirmed, about a state that deliberately made their absentee ballot such that a first class forever stamp would not suffice so it'll be returned for insufficient postage. But uh, you know, is, is whatever that stamp costs now, 50 cents, is that a poll tax? Yes. Uh, why not do it uh, postage prepaid? And by the way, nobody under the age of 25 even knows what a stamp is. So if you want to cut younger voters and poor voters, this is just what you do. This is the vote by mail playbook. Tomas, your state was the star of the clip we saw, right? And... This voter fraud thing, we just can't seem to get away from it. Um, I don't actually know what I want you to talk about. I just want you to talk about why it resonates so much with the people on the right and why the evidence that it doesn't exist isn't convincing. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would point to a couple of things. Um, one is, you know, we've been, we and others, we've been in the voting rights community have said for years, right, that the cases of, of voter impersonation fraud are, you know, infinitesimally small, right? People, you know, don't, uh, this just doesn't happen. Um, and yet, right, I think it shows the power of a really compelling narrative because it is an easy story to tell. Uh, it also, um, you know, I think plays into other narratives that go with it, right? It plays into the narrative about, you know, actually, it's not that the country is changing. It's not that, you know, people disagree with you. It's not that people see the world differently from you. It's just that people are playing a trick on you. Um, you know, it's no accident that many of the stories, you know, some of the stories about voter fraud, you know, get dreamt up, right? Tied to narratives about generally and sometimes immigration in particular. You know, Chris Kobach, the former Secretary of State of Kansas, you know, would, would, would tell this story about uh, a group of Somali people bust over to uh, bust over to Kansas from Oklahoma that was debunked. And yet he, he used a congressional testimony after a state court and said there's no evidence that this has happened, right? So, so it's about confirming the things that people already believe about lots of other things. Um, it's kind of the welfare queen, like Reagan's welfare yeah, queen. Similar. Like I mean, nothing you can do can ever undo that 
image. That's right. I mean, I think the other thing I would add to it is that by using the very broad term voter fraud, right, it, it, it elides the specific idea of voter impersonation. So in fact, in North Carolina, we did have election fraud. You know, we had in the 9th Congressional District an operative for the Republican congressional candidate for that district in 2018, Mark Harris, who broke North Carolina election laws, even going so far as to have people filling out absentee ballots for other people uh, that ended up having that election be rerun. Um, you know, that is, that, that is vote theft. That is breaking the election laws. But it's nothing that's a kind of targeted voter ID, other types of voting restrictions law, restriction laws that ever stop. I mean, laws like that are a question of pure enforcement. Thank you. So now is the moment where we are going to show you another clip, clip from Rigged. Um, we're running kind of behind a little bit, so let's try to get to it. And so a little preamble about what it is, Mac, and then we'll move to the, to the next clip. You're muted. Okay. Uh, so this clip is about two other strategies to suppress the vote, uh, gerrymandering and voter suppression uh, through voter intimidation. Uh, this takes place in Texas. Yeah, my home state. You're being viewed by 250 people. Gerrymandering involves primarily two different methods of uh, dealing with voters of the opposite party. You can pack voters into districts or you can crack them uh, into districts to make them ineffective. Texas is as good an example of packing and cracking as anywhere in the country, particularly the Dallas-Fort Worth area, if you look at the map that was originally drawn and approved by the Republicans in 2011. Why would this district from the north controlled by Anglos up here in a suburban county. Why would it come in to Tarrant County like this? As well, it's because they came in and they picked up Latino voters. And you see that they just very carefully pick up this big group of Latino voters, then come back and pick up another group of Hispanic voters like that. This is a classic cracking of Latino voters. Cracking is taking the people of color and cracking them into as many districts as possible where their vote won't make a difference. Packing is putting as many African Americans or Hispanics into as few a districts as possible. This shows District uh, 30, which is this packed district. Well, to get a sense of how packed that district is, we're going to shade both African Americans and Hispanics together. So the black plus Hispanic population, then in purple, you start to see what's going on. You've got a district here that virtually doesn't have anything in it except purple. A uh, classic way of undermining minority voting strength. If you favor one side over the other, you can clearly take a right turn on Maple Street and a left turn on Mulberry Street and have a partisan impact. There's also an opportunity for the maximum mischief in, in, in the uh, line drawing. The Republicans are able to draw unbelievably precise districts that maximize partisan advantage, where you can have a state where the state is relatively even between the Democrats and the Republicans, and yet the Republicans may win two thirds or three quarters of the congressional districts. And that's what we're seeing as a result of the redistricting in many states in 2010. The party in power really decides who's going to stay in power. And that's not real democracy. And that's what we have in way too many states in our country right now. People feel that their vote doesn't count. And gerrymandering makes sure that they feel like their vote doesn't count. Because what happens is you get pushed into a district that is completely safe for one party or the other. And if it's completely safe, why vote? <laughs> The whole idea is to make voting seem like a dangerous proposition, that it's something that might get you in trouble. And again, what that does is over a period of time, it insulates 
Republicans against the effect of African-American Hispanic population growth. In Edwards County, Texas, we received reports that the local sheriff who's connected to the militia movement and who prides herself on being, you know, this tough cowgirl sheriff, she had actually engaged personally in efforts to intimidate the voters. The issue of voter fraud has been very prevalent since I've been here. They're tired of, you see it, you know it, everybody around you knows it. Why isn't someone doing something about it? Who's 814? Right, thank you very much. 814, how long has he been here? He's been here since the first of the month. Since the first of the month? Yeah. The sheriff has alleged people voting incorrectly that have not. She has threatened to investigate people for illegal voting that have not. She has someone in jail now. I'm not guilty of nothing because I did the right thing as I went to go do it. I asked. The gentleman is under arrest for voter fraud and voter impersonation. He's accused of impersonating his grandfather. There's no way a 40-year-old man is going to be mistaken for someone who's almost 100 years old. In the first case, he went to prison for delivery of a controlled substance. Once he was on parole, he pretty much knew he wasn't supposed to vote. It was just probably catch me if you can or ha ha ha. I don't really know the motive behind it. I guess maybe one day he'll tell us. But at this point, he's just kind of trying to play the victim. I do feel that it was uh, a mistake that was done by the ladies working the poll in not actually comparing the date of birth. The date is clearly stated on the registered list as 8-9-1915. Now Manuel was on parole. He should not have voted, but the election officials shouldn't have allowed it either. He asked if he could vote. That tells me that he didn't know if he could or not. The intimidation comes in the arrest itself. Him sitting in jail would send a very strong message to a lot of people and intimidate a lot of people as to not to go out and vote. When we throw this sheriff out, this intimidation will come to a stop. This is voter suppression and it's illegal. You have the exact same power in this election as I do, as the person next to you. And you have together a whole lot more than Pam Elliott does. Are you ready? Texas, our Texas, so wonderful, so great. I just want to thank everybody here. This election has been, and I hate to say it, horrible. Horrible, 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 horrible things being said, horrible mud being slung, all in an effort to rid Edwards County of little old me. Do you have labor strings or? Yeah, I think Sheriff wanted him in labor strings. So, Sheriff, she has been diligently trying to root, root out the corruption ever since she took office over here. She already has. We've had more arrests ever. Perhaps this might make some of the people who are entertaining the idea of, of voting illegally, it may wake them up and say, hey, they're not going to let me get away with it if I get caught. This county has the highest rate of voter fraud allegations with the Secretary of State and Attorney General's Office than any of the other 254 counties in the state. Houston's got 10 million people in it. We've got 1,100, and we have a higher rate of voter fraud? Please. Right now, we're delivering election equipment. I wonder if we can put that tabulator right here. Ready. We can't let it drop. How you doing, Joe? Did you vote today? I think the polls are actually open until 7. Our goal is to, you know, win this election, and I think we can do it. Okay. All right. Let me get yeah, go over and vote. Go get that done. We've really put a, a big effort in to try to get as many people to the polls as we can today. You got something to get your name on it, right? That's it. That is it. That's all I used. Hey. How's everything going? Good. You on top? I don't know. I don't know. Wherever God tells me to do, that's all it's going to be. Got one. Pamela Elliott, 
Republican, 61.8% of the votes. John Harris, 38% of the votes. Just, just blessed, really. <laughs> Always speechless, always after seeing these things. Um, we're gonna do, I'm gonna try to do the next set of questions and also the question and answer at the same time, if you don't mind, so if you bear with me. Um, first, let me say in the Q&A, Patricia Smallin, I think is her name, you put a very useful um, uh, link up, but it only went into the Q&A section. So if you don't mind, if you could share it in the chat section, that would be great. The one from Bazelon about the voter challenge statues. statutes. Um, someone else wanted to talk about whether or not we're going to commit ourselves to be volunteers in the polls. And is there a way for you to figure out, is there a centralized place to figure out how you do that? Does anyone know if that's the case where you can figure out how to volunteer at polls or you just have to go state by state? I think that's state state. Your, your state's going to have a specific set of protocols there. Okay, thank you so much. I'm just trying to get through the process ones. Someone acknowledged about the process in Oklahoma where you have to have a witness and you have to have voter a copy of your voter uh, registration attached and just wanted to really acknowledge the overly, the ways in which just making the process overly complicated can also deter people um, from voting. Thank you, Patricia, I see it in the chat now. Can, can uh, deter people from uh, voting. Is there, do you believe that sending out, I'm going to ask you this, Tomas, I think, because you're sort of in the thick of this. Do you think states like California that are sending these absentee ballots out to everyone will increase turnout? I think it is, I, I think one of the biggest things that always can affects turnout is people's motivation in terms of candidates for or against candidates you know, the fact that it's a presidential year. I think pre-COVID, we were looking at a high turnout year uh, just because of the stakes of this election. The fact that this is an election where you have all these major races, plus like 2010, you have control, you have the census and control of redistricting next year on top of all this stuff, right? So it's like 2008 and 10 put together. It's a once every 20 years kind of election in terms of those kinds of implications. Um, you know, what we really don't know is it really is gonna depend on the habits of voters. So in California, people are used to voting by mail. Um, voting mail is pretty common there. Um, you know, there are some states where like Washington state, Oregon, uh, you know, vote by mail is the default. In North Carolina, only 4% of voters in the 2016 general election voted by mail. Uh, so if you sent every voter in North Carolina a mail ballot, you may not get the same kind of results that you get in California in terms of participation. So it really is gonna depend on the place. Carol, I think, we've been um, watching, yeah. hold on, I'm going to ask you a different question if you don't mind. Oh, okay. Unless you have something you really want to add to that. Well, you know, and, and I just wanted to say what happened here in Georgia um, with the coronavirus is that we had the highest turnout of Democrats since 2008 um, with that combination of being in person and with the, the mail-in ballots. And so right now the legislature, the Republicans in the legislature are trying to roll back the mailing out of the request for absentee ballots because it worked too well. So Carol, we're still in the classroom with these young people, right? And we have watched the kids who are really our students or who could be our students out in the streets this summer protesting over Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. And one of the things that seems to be a constant discussion is whether or not voting matters as much as protest, as if they are in conflict with right. each other. And so when these young people say, my vote doesn't matter, that's why I'm in the streets, what would you say to them? 
what would you tell us what we all should say? Like you say it and then we're just gonna tell it. <laughs> and, 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 and part of what I, I do is I'm like, understand, they don't want you to vote. And they're trying to shut down your voice. So like what they did at Prairie View, where, yeah. you, right? Where you got 11 days of early voting in surrounding Waller County and Prairie View got three days of early voting and two of those days, the machines were off campus. What? Or like North Carolina A&T, where they, draw, they drew a, um, a congressional district they split North Carolina A&T between two congressional districts. New Hampshire, where they're requiring, I said, don't cede your power. It is a combination of, of the protest and the policies that you are demanding and then moving it into the political realm so that those policies can take hold. When you, when you cede your power, other folk are making the decisions and they are targeting you because what you want in terms of the environment, in terms of uh, access to you know, safe gun laws, right? Um, in, in terms of school debt and access to affordable college, all of those things, they don't get on the table if you are not in the ballot box. And, and they get it, they get it, they get it. Oh, Mac. Watching this documentary, the it was like watching a pre-Trump era activity where even the most insidious kind of behavior was more polite, was more orderly. Um, even as that guy explained to that lady about how he wanted to stop people from voting, he said it in a way that was like, why, why won't you join me too? It was welcoming almost. What are the polls going to look like this November? How chaotic should we expect them to be? Yeah, I mean, just what do you think it's going to look like? I, I think it's going to be tough. Uh, the, the election broadly will be a high turnout election. Uh, there will be uh, a bunch of fails around increased vote by mail volume the the election infrastructure may not be ready and the postal service may not be ready uh and at the polls we will go into the election with a deficit of experienced poll workers and a very high turnout and uh a republican party that nationally has been under constraints not to engage in voter intimidation uh, which constraints were removed uh, uh, by a federal court earlier this year, last year. Uh, and so uh, there will emerge a number of organizations that will recruit poll workers uh, to go into that part of town to prevent voter fraud uh, from occurring. And many of them will challenge the credentials of individual voters. And doing that can create two good things from their point of view. One is they may succeed in uh, uh, negating the votes of some voters, but at the very least, uh, they'll slow the process down in that part of town and the lines will be much longer and some people have to get back to work. I got a child care problem, whatever it is. Um, so uh, I think things will be more raw. Uh, there will be more muscle and uh, uh, it'll make prior years look polite in memory. David, uh, one of our uh, people, when somebody in our audience wants to know, do you think we should just have an election day holiday where people take off, they have the opportunity to, you don't have to worry about getting there before work, or you don't have to worry about the ways in which you might be delayed if you had, and you might have more volunteers if you had an election holiday. What do you think about that? I would sign on to that, certainly, but I think we have to think even more broadly about how we take barriers away that have been put in, in between people and their right to vote. Um, and that's really what has been going on. Um, and folks have talked about it, you know, I mean, it's, it's, 
it's trying to skim a little bit off the top in all of these different ways. Um, I think back to Kentucky the other day, um, in which the polls close at six o'clock, right? So everybody who got off of work at six o'clock and then tried to get into that parking lot at the same time, they were banging on the doors of the convention center trying to get in to vote. Um, why do the polls close at six o'clock in Kentucky? Um, if you if you were one, let's say you're a 19 year old living in West Louisville who goes to a, a, a rally over that weekend um, and maybe learns for the first, uh, tunes in late to that Senate uh, primary and you get inspired and want to go cast a ballot for a candidate, but there's one uh, a precinct open in the entire county and maybe you work from eight in the morning until five in the afternoon at, at Kroger or wherever else, maybe you're an essential worker and how are you going to get the time off? How are you going to travel to the shuttle, to the election place, and then wait in line, and then vote, and then travel back and get back to work if you don't have a job that's flexible for four hours? All of these things. So, you know, making election day a holiday is a start, but we need more early voting. We need more mail voting. We need to take all of these little barriers that have come up uh, and start to, to take them down. And we have to remember that for a lot of people in this country, voting by mail is not going to work. They are still going to want to vote in person for any number of reasons. Um, some because the mail where they are is not safe, reliable, and secure. Maybe that's in, in cities, maybe that's in rural areas, maybe it's on Native American land. There are lots of reasons why we absolutely still need in-person balloting. Maybe uh, this is because your absentee ballot didn't come in the mail, because there's this long process of applying online for an application, then having the application come to you, and then mailing the application in to get the ballot, and then the ballot has to come to you. You know, stamps going back and forth every time, all of this in a wobbly postal service. Um, maybe you turn 18 on October 24th, and how are you going to, uh, go through that entire process in a week. So we are gonna to have to have a robust by mail system and also a robust in-person system, all of this during a pandemic. It's a tall, tall order for us. You know, um, one of the things I love about librarians is that they are clearly called to curiosity. They are the kind, I tell my students, if you go in the library, you, your whole paper will be done if you talk to a librarian. You'll have all the ingredients you need to just write it up. And that seems to me to be a calling for them. And I think in some ways, having talked to all of you, it seems to be a calling for you too. And so what keeps you going in this fight? Somebody used the word hope, right? I think hope is what it is ultimately, but what is the thing that tells you when the defeats keep coming, this is the work that I must do. Let's start with you, uh, Tomas. I think you might be the youngest in this also. I, so let's- <laughs> I think I am. I mean, I think what keeps, look, I think what, what keeps me going is, is the fact that I, you know, I feel very fortunate to be in a paying job doing this. And I think about all the people who, who do this, you know, because they believe. Right. And because they know what is right for their communities, I, I think about, you know, sort of seeing, you know, people kind of put their lives aside, right, in the present day. I mean, one of the things that's challenging, sometimes we do some work with young people and we, the sort of the fights of past decades are seem like an abstraction, like a black and white photo to them sometimes. And, you know, but seeing people sort of act now, you know, and, and, and look beyond themselves and are really, you know, seeing individual instances of that, I find you know, to be, to be something that keeps me going, especially when it gets to be a real slog. Okay, David, since you're unmuted, how about you next? When I was writing this book, I spent some time in Alabama working um, with the Alabama Voting Rights Project that was going door to door, waiting outside uh, bus stops and libraries and uh, uh, trying to register to vote uh, the 70,000 people who had been uh, caught up by Alabama's moral turpitude laws 
uh, and had lost their rights to vote because of a felony conviction. And oftentimes it was one of those felony convictions that was, uh, you know, a trumped up, uh, a no pun intended charge. Um, and um, we were outside the bus station one August morning in Birmingham, Alabama, and I walked up to a woman um, and they, they had trained me how to do this. Um, and we walked up to her and, and she kind of, you know, shakes her head at the, you know, middle-aged white guy walking towards her as she's uh, waiting for the bus stop on her way to work. And I, uh, we're out here today trying to talk to people about a change in the law. If you know anybody who has lost a right to vote because of a conviction in the past and her eyes kind of grow wide and she seems interested and she's like, well, I had a conviction, I can't vote. And we walk through the list. It, it turns out she had been convicted of marijuana possession which fell under moral turpitude in Alabama and lost her right to vote forever at the age of 17. She had never exercised her right to vote because of this law. And on the spot, we signed her back up and we're all in tears. And she's like, all I ever wanted to do was vote for Obama once and I couldn't do it. And she's like, you're telling me I can vote? I will be a lifelong voter. And the power of that moment will keep me going forever. Hey, Mac, how about you? I agree uh, with David. I, I've, I've, from the time I was a little boy, felt that election day in America was a beautiful thing. Whatever is going on the other 364 days, on that one day, we all together speak with an equal voice. Everyone is equal on election day. And I think that is a central, the central strength of our country. And we, the rig team, made this film because we believe most Americans, not all Americans, but the vast majority of Americans, and frankly, Amendment 4 in Florida bears this out, if exposed to people trying to take away, carve away, shrink, shave the right of their fellow citizens to vote, they would say, look, I don't care how you vote, but you have the right to vote. I will protect your right to vote. That's not what we do in the United States of America. And I still believe that. There is a, you know, more people not that way than I wish, but I believe that we have the opportunity to appeal to the fundamental goodness of Americans the way that the last few months have, have shown that, you know, a lot of people walk around not understanding the systemic racism in the criminal justice system. Well, voter suppression is what systemic racism is in our democracy. And so we need to expose that the same way that the George Floyd and, you know, 50 other instances have, has, have exposed it in criminal justice. Uh, and so that idealism and the experiences that I've had registering people to vote, persuading people to vote, uh, watching people vote, talking to people after they have voted and what does it mean to them? Uh, that'll keep me going forever. I have no plans to stop. Okay, Carol, unmute yourself, you're next, yeah. Um, and for me, it's, it's knowing that I stand on the shoulders. Um, Fannie Lou Hamer, in Mississippi in the early 1960s who, who tried to register to vote and they beat her senseless. And when she went to the hospital, they forcibly sterilized her. And she continued to fight. It's Vera Piggy, also in Mississippi, who used her beauty shop as a, as a site of organizing voters in the end up for the NAACP to get folks registered to vote to figure out how do you take down these and I mean and they are up against it when I see that kind of strength and Mrs. Amelia Boynton out of Selma mm, mm, oh yeah and oh yeah and I've got to say and then this moment that we're in right now I have believed it and now I see it, um, this regime has shredded and debased so many of our institutions of democracy. 
But what it hasn't shredded and debased have been the American people. And they are demanding democracy. They are out in the streets demanding democracy. They are on top of their legislative reps, their, their senators, <laughs> their representatives demanding democracy. When people are, are demanding democracy in this kind of way, when I see people standing in line for seven hours to vote, and knowing that they're like, uh-uh, I will crawl through broken glass so we can get the democracy we deserve instead of the kind they're trying to foist upon us. That's where my hope is. My hope is in the people. So the last question is going to be a round robin, literally round robin. All of you just unmute yourselves now. Because this is the American Library Association, I want you to tell us a book that's not yours that you think people should be reading right now. And Mac, if you want to, you can give us a documentary. <laughs> but it's something, a book that is not yours that people should be reading right now. Okay, David. Um, I think Ari Berman's book um, on the history of voting rights in this country is terrific. Gilda Daniels has a new book out um, on voter suppression. Both of them are absolutely amazing. I would endorse them both one too. Um, although of course, Carol Anderson's books are, crucial and essential. Uh, just because I can't say my own books doesn't mean I can't say the work of my fellow panelists. <laughs> That's true. Okay, Tomas. Uh, on the law side, um, you know, uh, Rick Hassan is a law professor at University of California, Irvine, does a lot of public facing writing on this. He has a book out this year called Election Meltdown that gets into a lot of the nitty gritty details of so many of the little things that uh, affect voting rights, especially uh, decisions made at the local level. Okay, Mac. Uh, I will name a documentary. It's called Slay the Dragon, and it's about the citizen effort in Michigan to combat gerrymandering by the creation of a citizen-led, nonpartisan redistricting commission. It's inspiring. Michigan is actually a pretty feel-good story out of all of this as well. So if you're looking for some moments where uh, Americans triumph in the ways that we want them to, I think Michigan is a great place to look. I'm gonna offer, I'm gonna, Carol, you, you offer your book and then I'll offer one. Uh, you know, the thing is I'm in the middle of another book, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you're not reading anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, pull from the ranks, the things you teach in your class that you love. Well, you know, actually I'm, I'm teaching uh, voting rights and voter suppression this fall. So mm -hmm. um, I've got uh, David's book. On my on my list for my students, um, and I've got rat, and then f, and then asterisk asterisk, <laughs> um, because understanding the the bureaucratic um, nuances that in fact create these walls that block people from voting, and he just lays it out so beautifully. Um, that and there's another book I love, and it's it's Kelly Carter Jackson. Um, that deals with the violence that abolitionists had to use to get free. Because I think understanding that long arc of history gives us perspective. I was going to say that um, I love Mary Frances Berry's History Teaches Us to Resist. It's just such a good way to rethink and think about history as not just these things that happen to us, but these things that we demand um, that they happen. And I'm also right now reading this um, uh, American history. I don't even know what it's called, but it's Di Callie Gross and Dana Rainyberry. Yes. It's like American history, black a black women's <laughs> history of America or something like that. It's mm -hmm. mind blowing because they started anyway. It's mind blowing. Um, I can't thank you enough. Um, this has been so interesting to me. When I first started showing documentaries like this as a political science professor, I would just have to go home and nap, like have a bourbon or something. Like I couldn't tolerate it. And the thing is, you talking to people like you have helped me process it so that I can help my students process it as, as well. These kinds of conversations always make me more hopeful that there are more people in the fight, um, which means that it also then there's a better chance that we can win. And so just thank you so much for participating in this. Now I have some things I have to um, read out. 
thank you all for watching this afternoon and for all of your good questions. I want to thank my panelists. Let's say their names again, Carol Anderson, David Daly, um, Matt Heller, and Tomas Lopez. Before we conclude, here are the results of two polls we posted. Is that a thing? Does somebody have a poll? <laughs> all right. It said it on here. Here are the results. Julie, you pop back on camera. Do you have a poll or no? <laughs> okay, good. Um, also, if your library would like to book a virtual screening of Rigged, I think it's really worth it. Um, they came to our campus and it was really good for our students who are actively engaged in voting rights protests and so it was even good for them. Please go to their rep to their website www.riggedthefilm r i g g e d the film.com. Also remember the excellent books by Professor Anderson, One Person No Vote, David Daly's Unrigged, my book uh, the Race Whisperer are available at your independent bookstores and yes, in your public libraries. And also, you know, if you're interested. <laughs> so for the Social Responsibilities Roundtable and the American Library Association, thank you to you all for joining us. And remember to make sure and register to vote in November. Our democracy depends on you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, y'all. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. It was great.